Good morning, Corona Church family. Today, I would like to invite you to have a word of prayer for the service today. Please bow your hands and uh, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, today we ask you to open our hearts, our minds, so that we can be ready for the message that our pastor is going to have for us today. We thank you, Lord, because you have been good to us. We've had a good week, and we feel good. We have felt your presence during the week, and we now ask you to be with us as we receive the message. Help us, Lord, to always remember you, to know that with you, we can have victory in all our battles. Please be with our pastor as he delivers the message. Be with each member of our church in all their struggles and joys. And we ask you, Lord, to especially be with the people that are hurting, people that are hungry, people that are worried. We ask you to give them a special dose of your love and comfort. Thank you again for being with us and for the message we're about to receive. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. conference-wide church and building fund. You know, Thursday, we just celebrated Thanksgiving, where we especially give thanks to God for all the blessings he has given us. 
You know, God doesn't want us to just give him thanks for the blessings. He wants us to share the blessings we have with others. And so this is an opportunity that we have to share with other churches and school schools that might need help. Thank you. Our next song is going to be, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. church family my name is Rebecca Martinez and I will be reading the scripture for the Sabbath which is found in Psalm 86 and I will be reading the Holman Christian Standard Version listen Lord and answer me for I am poor and needy protect my life for I am faithful you are my God save your servant who trusts in you be gracious to me Lord for I call to you all day long bring joy to your servant's life because I turn to you Lord for you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, rich in faithful love to all who call on you. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my plea for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. Whether you are watching this service in the morning, afternoon, or evening, we welcome you. We trust and pray that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And if you were not able to be with family, that you knew God was still with you and you could praise him for the blessings that he has given you throughout your life. That you can even bless him for those times of difficulty such as we are now in, in which we need to be more and more aware of how God is at work in spite of what we face. In fact, that will be the focus of my message this morning. This morning I will be using the Holman Christian Bible as my text. And we will be looking at Psalm 86. Hudson Taylor was a missionary in the mid-1800s. He was a missionary to China for 50 years. He was one of the first missionaries who didn't go to a foreign country and try to bring all the trappings of the culture from which he came to those to whom he would minister. In fact, he wore Chinese garments as he lived in China. He established the China Inland Mission. Over 18,000 people were credited with coming to Christ through his ministry. Hudson Taylor, at the beginning of his ministry, was sailing to China. He, he was not sailing in an ocean liner. He was not in a steamship. He was in a sailing vessel. And one day, as they were going through some areas where there were some sunken reefs, suddenly the wind died down, and the current was carrying them towards the reefs. 
Everything they tried to do to stay away from the reefs failed, and T Hudson Taylor recorded in his journal what happened next. The captain said to him, We've done everything we know that can be done. A thought occurred to me, Hudson said, and I replied, No, there is one thing we have not yet done. What is that? asked the captain. Four of us on board are Christians, Hudson said. Let us each retire to his own cabin and in agreed prayer ask the Lord to give us immediately a breeze. Taylor prayed briefly and then certain that the answer was coming went back on deck and asked the first officer please let down the sails. What would be the good of that he answered. I told him we'd been asking God for a wind that it was coming immediately. Within minutes, the wind began to blow and carried them safely past the reefs. My message in a nutshell this morning is this. When facing the distresses of life, God and God alone will be the ultimate help and comfort we need. When facing the distresses of life, God and God alone can provide the immediate help and comfort we need. We are going to look at a psalm of David, Psalm 86. We don't know the exact circumstances through which David was going through and why he wrote this psalm. We do know, and I hope you have your Bibles or you're looking at a device and looking at this passage with me. We do know from verse 14, that he says, Oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. That word insolent can mean violent men, rebellious men. And to be rising up against means they are coming after him. They want to seek him. They are ruthless. They seek his life. David's life is in danger. Most commentaries surmise that this was probably during the time when David was hiding from Saul, when Saul was seeking his life. There, one, other comment, one commentary said that it may be the time when Absalom was seeking his life. And I tend to think that it probably was the time of Absalom for, Absalom for two reasons. Number one, when, when Saul was seeking David's life, David was out with his men hiding in caves, and yes, times were difficult, but David was able to use craft and and sometimes he would use distractions to, to stay away from Saul and his men. And even when Saul was placed within his reach, not once but twice, he refused to take Saul's life. I think the second reason I think this was when Absalom was trying to take his life was David admits in this psalm that he needs forgiveness. He needs forgiveness. And that really results more from going all the way back to his sin with Bathsheba. When his sons later on would rebel and his sons would act in ways and deal with immorality, he would not be able to, to discipline them or, or to punish them in, in ways that he should have. And it ended up with one of his sons basically raping his stepsister, Absalom's sister. The result of David's sin, the sin he committed by being with Bathsheba and murdering her husband by proxy eventually affected his own children because they too used that as an excuse for their immorality. In fact, one of his sons, Amnon, raped his stepsister, Absalom's sister. And Absalom was so angry that he killed Amnon. And David banished Absalom from Jerusalem. For over three years, Absalom was away. And his anger and his bitterness grew until he decided to do a coup against his father, David. And so, it makes sense to me that the distress David talks about is this time when his own son is seeking his life. When people are violent and they want to take his life. 
And so David is in distress. David is dealing with difficulties. David needs to know that God has not forsaken or left him. And so David prays. And his prayers may seem a bit much to you and me. For David does not make requests of God. He uses a commanding sentence, an imperative. And he commands God, not just one thing or two things, but several things. If you look at Psalm 86, you will notice the things he asks God to do. The first thing is in verse 1. Listen, Lord. Three times in the psalm, he tells God to listen to him. He says, answer me, Lord. Twice he says, answer. He says, protect my life. He tells God that God should be merciful to him. Be gracious to me. He tells God, bring joy to my life. He says, Lord, you hear my prayer. Listen to my plea, verse 6. Verse 7, you will answer me. Verse 11, teach me your way. Verse 16, turn to me. Verse 11, give me an undivided heart. Because of the distress he is under, David goes into the prayer, his prayer room and he prays. And at first glance, this could be considered an arrogant prayer. It could be considered almost a blasphemous prayer. For in this prayer, David tells God what he thinks God should do. He doesn't make requests and say, please God, give me this. He, he puts his prayer and the sentences in the imperative. God, you must. God, do this. What are the things he tells God he wants God to do for him? The very first thing isn't quite so bad. He says, listen, Lord. In fact, three times in this psalm, he asks God to listen. He says, answer me, Lord. Twice he asks and tells God, actually, to answer him. He says, preserve or protect my life. Twice. He says, save me. Twice. He says, be gracious or merciful to me three times. He tells God, make me glad, give me joy in my life. He tells God, please, teach me. He doesn't say please, he says, teach me your way. He goes on and says, give me an undivided mind or heart to reverence you. He then says, turn to me. And again, be gracious to me, verse 16. And then finally he says, show me a sign of your favor or goodness. If you look at that and think about that, how could David possibly be so audacious as to not make requests of God, but to make demands of God? And I think when you look at the rest of the psalm, you begin to see that David can make these requests because of his relationship and understanding of who God is. I want you to notice the first thing in the psalm that talks about David's relationship with God and why he could be so bold as to make these demands. He says, first of all, in verse 1, you are my God. You're not just a God up there somewhere. You're not just a God out there that I have to figure out how, how to relate to you. You are my God. In, in verses 8 through 13, David spends much time in talking to God about what he has learned about God. In verse 8, he says, There is no one like you among the gods. You may pause and say, Wait a minute. David knew there was only one God. Why would he talk about being among the gods? Because every nation had their own gods. And it was believed if, if one nation was stronger than another, that that nation's God was the true God. And so David is, is saying, you are, you are, there's no one like you among the gods because 
not because he believed in other gods, but because he knew that Jehovah alone is a God you could talk to. He says there's no works like yours. In the Old Testament especially, God's works are those miraculous things he did for his people. Delivering them from Egypt, going through the Red Sea, manna in the wilderness, providing victory over enemies. Verse 9, he says, All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor your name. Some people use this to teach that God's going to save everyone. That's not what David is saying here. What he's really saying is those nations who believed in other gods, they will come to a point where they will recognize that you are the only God. Verse 10, you are a great and perform wonders. You alone are God. You alone are God. There's no one else who has the power you have. There's no one else who has the character you have. There's no one else as compassionate as you. There's no one else as just as you. There's no one else as holy as you. There's no one else as forgiving as you. You alone are God. He goes on. He says in verse um, 13, Your faithful love is great. Your faithful love. That's the word loving kindness. It's the word kesed in the Hebrew. It's almost equivalent to, to grace in the New Testament. He says, you're the God who gives grace, loving kindness. Your love is beyond fathomable. And he says, you are the one who can deliver me from the depths of Sheol, which is another word for the grave. When David understands who God is, this mighty God who does mighty works, whose character is good and gracious and loving and can be trusted, who is faithful to the promises he makes, who is slow to anger, it says in verse 15, in rich in faithful love and truth. Because David knows that to be true, he can make the demands he makes of God. Because God is a compassionate God, he knows God will hear him and listen to him when he prays. Because God is a God whose love is towards those whom he created and whom he has redeemed, he knows that God is willing to protect his life. Because God is a gracious God, he will be merciful. Because God is gracious, even in times of distress, he can bring joy. Because God is holy and righteous, he will deliver his people. As you look at all these things that David asks of God, he asks them not because he's being arrogant, not because he's being, de- being demanding even, not because he's being blasphemous. He asks it because he knows the heart of the God he serves. And he knows how much God loves him. What is interesting is that after every request, David gives a reason why God should answer. And I want to go through them one by one with you. In verse 1, listen to me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. The word for poor there is a term taken from battle where somebody is up against it and there's no way out. I am poor and needy. God, I need you to listen to me because I don't have answers for my own life. The second request, protect my life for I am, and the King James Version and other versions say, for I am godly. And you look at that and you say, wait a minute, he just said he's poor and needy. Now he says he's godly? Is he trying to say he's better than others, therefore God should answer him? No. What he's really saying is, the word in the Hebrew means that it, those who are godly are those who are the object of God's mercy. And because they are the object of his mercy, they become like him. He's talking about result, not cause. He's not saying, God, you should protect my life because I am godly. He said, God, protect my life because I am one upon whom you have bestowed your mercy and your grace. You are my God. Save your servant, 
because I trust in you. Be gracious because I call on you all day long. Be gracious because I'm with you all the time. I can be with you all the time because you are gracious, David says. Be joy, bring joy to your servant's life because I turn to you, Lord, because I submit to you, is what David is saying. Lord, be merciful because I'm submitting my entire being to you, and only when I submit to you and your will for my life can I really find joy. And because you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, rich in faithful love to all who call on you. God, I'm not calling upon a, a God who's out for vengeance. I'm not a calling to a God who's out to, to, to pay back. I'm calling upon a God who is ready to forgive and kind and faithful in love to those who serve him. Lord, hear my prayer. Why? Because it's a plea for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, and you will answer me. Why? Because there is no other God like you. No one can perform miraculous deeds like you can. And then he goes on, verse 11, Teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind or heart to fear your name. As you think about this psalm and all the things that David is asking of God up to this point, I think all of us, when we pray, we pray during times of difficulties, Lord, please hear me. We ask God to protect us and our families. We ask God to give us his grace. We ask him to restore joy to our lives. We admit we need his mercy. And we submit our lives to him. But I think verse 11 is something perhaps a key to how we need to pray for, to God and what we need to ask of him during times of distress. During this time, are you asking God to teach you his way that you can live by his truth? During this time, are you asking God to use the distresses of the life as we know it, the isolation for some financial distress, loneliness. Are you using this time asking God to teach you His way, to teach you those things you need to know? Are you willing to ask Him as David asked Him, give me an undivided mind or heart to serve you? When David's asking God to give an undivided heart, he's saying, God, put my affections, put my thoughts, put my will under your care and keeping. What he's asking is saying, God, take away those distractions of life. Take away those things that I, I rely on rather than rely upon, relying upon you and what you can provide. He's saying, make sure, God, that my heart, my thoughts, my feelings, my will, make sure that they are focused on you first and foremost. Oh, how we need that during times of distress. He goes on in verse 16 and says, Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to me, to your servant. And show me a sign of your favor. Are you asking God to help you see the favor he's placed on your life? It not, may not be monetary favor. It may not be even good health. But what, in what ways has God shown his favor to you? In what ways has God shown his favor to you? Every breath reveals his favor. The love of family and friends reveals his favor. Peace that comes from forgiveness of sin reveals his favor. Knowing that we have hope because we know that Jesus will one day come back and all the re results of sin will be gone. I can hear someone saying, but Pastor Gary, why does God answer some people's prayers and not others? W how can I 
ask God to save me from my distress when all around me things look bleak, when I'm going through such a terrible, difficult time. And there are people going through difficult times. I would remind you of what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 43. Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. When you pass, pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, and the Holy One of Israel your Savior. What God has promised that we can always, always, always count on is that whatever may be causing trouble or distress in our lives, God says He will be with us. He will walk us through it. He will ultimately deliver us. And because God can do that, we can say along with the psalmist, Lord, you have helped and comforted me. Have you experienced the help and comfort of God in your life? That peace that passes understanding, that joy and in spite of times of sorrow or during times of sorrow, that awareness of his presence that cannot be denied, the gift that comes at the right time, a phone call at the right time, an offered prayer at the right time. As I look at the psalm of David, the psalm that he gave in his time of distress, maybe I need to be more bold as I pray to God. Maybe I need to be able to say along with the psalmist, listen, God. Maybe I need to pray, be gracious to me, God. Give me joy, God. But above all, I want my prayer to be during this time. Teach me your ways that I might live by your truth. Give me an undivided heart that is not swayed by the distractions of life, that, that, that is not heartbroken during difficult times. Give me an undivided heart that will enable me to serve you first, others second, and myself last. The Psalm of David is an appropriate one for you and me today. I would remind you of the sentence I shared at the beginning. When facing the distresses of life, God and God alone can provide the ultimate help and comfort we need. As we are going through this journey of this not normal time, as we face the uncertainties of tomorrow, may you and I be reminded that we can pray to the one who alone can provide the ultimate help and comfort that we need. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are God and God alone. We thank you that you will answer us, maybe not in the way we want, but in the way that's best. Not at the time we think it should be, but in your timing, your will, and your way. Help us to be honest as we seek you, to admit our need of mercy and forgiveness and grace on a daily basis. May we recognize that we, like David, are poor and needy, and therefore we can call out to the God whose compassion never fails, whose loving kindness cannot be measured, and whose grace is sufficient. Be with us, I pray, and may we be able to share with others, and may they see your favor on us as we trust in you each day. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless and keep each one of you.